of how presumptuous it sounds that in over 40 years of searching no one but I and my wife mother two sons and brother and sister-in-law believe in the true Bible the true biblical God man that does not sound man, that do, that does that does sound egotistical and cultish oh yes and two friends of my sons and one of their cousins well let's see if I can do justice to what I believe is the true God of the Bible all of Christianity is divided into two armed camps there are Armenian Christians and there are Calvinist Christians the Armenians believe that God has given them three free will to choose Christ and the Calvinists believe that there is no free will that God himself has to do any saving to be done both sides believe in quote grace unquote that you uh, are saved through grace uh, saved by grace the Armenians believe that God gives you the grace to choose him or not the Calvinists believe that grace is all on the side of God that his grace is salvation that you are elected to a gracious salvation or you are appointed unto wrath the Calvinists have a monster God who elects some to salvation and roasts the rest in hell forever the Armenians have a wimpy God who provides a way of escape from hell but you have to save yourself by choosing him over choosing hell grace provides a choice God would do nothing to influence your choice that would not be fair you have to consciously choose to come unto God or it will not get done in this mortal existence the answer of course is that if in this mortal existence you do refuse to seek God and refuse to come unto him his burden is light his yoke easy etc then your destination is hell or the prison world and the spirit uh, quote and the spirit and the bride say come and let him whoever say whoever heareth say come and let him that is thir a thirst say come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely revelation 22 verse 17 the good news the gospel is to my way of thinking that if you do seek after Christ to become a son of God or a friend or brother of Christ himself sharing in his inheritance uh, quote as if children then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Romans 8 17 dot 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 if you do as the Bible wants you to do then you know that you were elected or predestined to do so but the even gooder gooder gospel that I find throughout the Bible and only a few others seem to know or even care that it is there is this quote God who is the Savior of all men especially of those that believe first Timothy 4 verse 10 and another one quote for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth First Timothy 2 3 verse uh, verse 3 and 4 does this mean that God is up there wringing his hands and saying to himself darn why can't why can't they be good so far all I can see is that delightful Ralphie babe and a few of his closest friends and family shoot quote who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth look at this gem quote dot, dot, dot. who hath resisted his will who hath resisted his will Romans 9 19 the answer of course is no one no one can resist God's will if it is his will to save all men first Timothy 2 uh, verse 3 and 4 then all men will be saved quote and I if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me this he said signifying the death he should die John 12 32 and 33 
Since many men have died with no salvation from God, my beloved Father is just one of them. These verses promises, these verse promise that my Father will be saved. First, first Peter 318 uh, through 4, 6 holds out this holds out that same promise and shows us that those in the quote prison world will be drawn unto him quote for Christ also hath suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit by which also he went and preached uh, by this by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison for 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 this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead that they might be judged according to man in the flesh but live according to God in the spirit first Peter 1 18 and 4 verse 6 according to God there are only two kinds of natural people in this world Jews and Gentiles Quote, and so all Israel shall be saved. As is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto him, unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, there they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are believe, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. Da, da, da. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Romans eleven verse twenty six through thirty two. Well uh, that takes care of all the Jews. How about the Gentiles? Quote and again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and loud him, all ye people. All Gentiles. And again, as I have said, Isaiah said, There shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise in shall and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. In him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Da, 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 da. To make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Da, 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 da. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they, sh and they that have not heard shall understand. Romans 15, verse 10 through 21. That does not leave out anybody. All Jews shall be saved, and all Gentiles shall be saved. Everybody will eventually be saved. Quote, for since by, by man, Adam, came death, by man, Christ, came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man, every man, in his own order. Then cometh the end when he, Christ, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Da, da, da. Then my dad says, Bob, he then must destroy the lake of fire since the lake of death since the lake of fire is called the second death according to revelations 21 verse 8 that's the end of hell too because revelation 20 verse 14 says and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire this is the second death is it my belief it it, 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 it is my belief also that even Satan will eventually be saved. The Bible does not leave out any being created by the great creator. Quote, And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea 
and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and under and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Revelation 5 verse 13. What about those kings of the earth? That will have fought against Christ at Armageddon during his second coming? Even they are ultimately found bringing, quote, the glory and honor of the nations, Gentiles, into the New Jerusalem, which has a, has a street on either side of which ha was the tree of life, yielding monthly fruit, the leaves which were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, Revelation 21 and 24, verse 22 and 13. Gentiles, this, this means heathen. This whole school in the sky was for us to know good and evil and to really appreciate heaven and to become God's, Christ's, friends and brothers. What is that stuff about everlasting punishment, everlasting destruction? Thanks to good concordances like the Young's, for example, we can now see that these apparent contradictions were antithetical. That is, the word aeon in the Greek can be both temporary and permanent, both everlasting or in a different contents, age lasting. And there have been several ages or dispensations also. For example, who shall be punished with everlasting punishment? First Thessalonians 1 verse 9. The concordance first shows that punishment means to pay justice. Next it shows that everlasting means age lasting and some ages in the Bible last a mere seven years or even as short as three days. Jonah 2 6 about the fish Everlasting destruction. Notice the scripture. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Hosea 13, verse 9. So, Bob, the everlasting destruction lasts only unto the age when God will be their help. What about Christ's commandments? To sell what you have, give that to the poor, and go and follow him? He also commanded us to raise the dead. He promised that no snakes could kill us, no poison could kill us. He also promised that anything we prayed for, he would provide. Paul explains that these were for a definite period in history to establishing the credibility of the apostles. They were to set up the Jewish kingdom ruled over by Christ. But now, in the age of grace, Paul has different orders from the risen, resurrected Christ today. It is a different dispensation. Quote, if you, have, if you have heard the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, Ephesians 3, verse 2, most of Christianity acts as if they have never heard of, the dis, of, of this dispensation. Paul is totally different from the other apostles. They are and were apostles of the Jewish kingdom, which has been postponed to the millennium. Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. We are to follow only him, our one apostle, for, quote, there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and it ain't water, Bob, one God and Father of all, Ephesians 4, verse 4 through 6. Paul is not the uh, 12th apostle replacing Judas. Matthias was. Paul is for our complete new dispensation. Water baptism was a system of works. Paul's dispensation can allow no works of any kind of salvation. You cannot mix works and grace in this dispensation. Quote, and if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be a works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Romans 11, verse 6. Instead of being baptized in water in this new dispensation, we are now baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ upon our belief in the Pauline Christ. Catholicism 
and all the false uh, religions like Mormonism, for example. Abort true belief by mixing works with grace and faith in spite of the clear warnings of Paul, such as, Now to him that worketh is not the reward. Not Now to him that... Um, this is what Paul warns. It says, uh, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned, da, da, da. but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Romans, verse, Romans 4, verse 4 and 5. If you even mix, if you mix even the smallest amount of works in the formula, you frustrate your reward of salvation or everlasting life. God wants it to be a gift. False religions want you to work for it. Mormons have to ha have to become worthy to get a temple recommend, etc. They have to take. They have to make themselves godly in spite of the fact that he died for the ungodly. Romans four, verse four and five. God does not want us to work for our merit or, or merit our salvation. Quote, for the wages, something you work for, of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. A difference of dispensation? Further proof? The Jewish water baptism works plus grace believers were told what and how to pray for things. Notice, notice the difference in Paul's dispensation of the grace of God, Ephesians uh, 3, verse 2. Quote, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And instead of selling all and giving to the poor, Paul says... We are worse than infidels if we provide not for our own. Also, Paul could also raise the dead at the change of the dispensations. At the change of dispensations, but later he could not even cure Timothy of his stomach problems and told him to, quote, take a little wine for, for thy stomach's sake, unquote. The dispensation of grace had come, and we are now in it. Too bad those snake-handling Christians don't believe in a change of dispensations. Many have lost their lives, and they were quite sincere and had a lot of faith. Wrong dispensation. Bob, our Gentile marching orders are not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and definitely not James. James, quote, quote, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. James 1.1. 1, 1. We are not Jews. We are not, uh, we are not Jews. We are Gentiles. Paul's message, message, Paul's message, quote, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, 18-21 Bob not very many Christians believe this next verse. It sounds too good to be true. Romans 4 goes to great lengths to show that as Christians, God no longer imputes sin to our account even though we sin. However, through Paul, he beseeches us to walk worthy as sons of God. We are still to repent of our sins to him to restore our fellowship, but we have the righteousness of God himself imputed to us forever. Our sins were, quote, imputed to him uh, forever, but he, Christ, left them at the cross. Quote, 
Blessed is the man to whom God will not impute sin. Romans 4, verse 8. Not only our past and present sins, but also our future sins will never, ever be imputed to us again by the simple act of our believing this about Paul's resurrection, uh, resurrected and risen Christ. Since we can, since we can sin, and even though we are beseeched to walk worthy of God, what does Paul say? Quote, What shall we say then? Shall we continue sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Romans 6, verse 1 and 2. I personally have repented many times of those sins that are no longer imputed to me. Thanks to these words through Paul by the risen Christ, I feel kind of like a baby that has pooped in his pants, but I notice that it happens less frequently. And I am no longer re I'm no longer running from God, but facing him squarely about such. I believe this is a device of his to get us to walk with him, to draw more closely to him. And I love it. It's a more manly thing to do than trying to run from him as Adam and Eve did at first. Paul's God, Paul's Christ, Paul's Holy Spirit are the true God, the true Christ, the Holy, the true Holy Spirit. And we are told by scripture that all three of this Trinity dwell in us if we are saved. <laughs> knowing this makes it very embarrassing if you intend to to acknowledge, to, to knowingly sin. I have still persisted in conscious sin, like a kid that knows something is wrong to do, but does it anyway. Amazingly, I always feel closer to God than if I had overcome the temptation. Yet, the next time the temptation is less and I truly feel closer to the one who created us all and knows us all better than we know ourselves. Our God, our Father, is a true gentleman. Yet, quote, he is closer than a brother, unquote. The Calvinists are right to the extent that God has elected and predestinated every human being, but they are wrong about his roasting the unelect in hell forever. The Arminians are right about us about our being able to come unto him freely, yet they are reluctant to admit that, quote, no man come unto me unless except it were given unto him given except it were given unto him of my father. John six six five. From the human point of view, I can concede. I can, I can concede perfect free will. Yet I am grateful that God. I'm 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 grateful that from God's side, whether you choose Him or not, or, or, or choose Him now or later, whether you love Him now or later, is just part and parcel of the entire big picture. For truly, quote, He worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. Ephesians one. Verse 11. Did faith in him come from me? No, Jesus Christ is author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 2. Did my belief in him and his word come from my exertion? No. For unto him it is given not only to believe on him. Uh, Philippians 1, 29. I guess the most wonderful thing that I have learned from God, the Father, is Son, Jesus Christ, and the Blessed Holy Spirit.